Well, I realize that what I'm about to say will not apply to everyone. When you make a mistake, how do you react? Now, I know some of you say, well, I just don't ever make mistakes. When you make an error, when you make a gaffe, how is it that you react? Is it to just pretend like nothing happened? Just ignore it entirely, maybe no one will notice? Maybe you point the finger of blame. It's him, it's her, they did it, it's their fault. Or maybe when you make a mistake, you just internalize it. Lots of regret, maybe that regret comes out, maybe it just stays inside and unspoken. Maybe for a few of us, in rare occasions, we actually admit that we've made a mistake, to own up to it. And there are lots of mistakes of all varying levels. Sometimes we're driving and we make a mistake, and what do you do? You, you just give that little wave. Yeah, I know what I did. They may not be able to see your eyeballs, but you're there. Or maybe you're cooking, and you put one cup instead of a half a cup, and you're trying to pull it back out, trying to figure out if you can fix this error on your own. Sometimes your mistakes are immortalized, even on TV, where it gets captured and people can go back and look at it. Like my friend in the state high school basketball playoffs, preacher's kid, final seconds of the game, and, and what does the camera catch but him just shoving somebody under the net, immortalized on the nightly news. Never lived that one down. Sometimes it shows up in a picture where you become a meme with some clever line of one gaffe that you've made or someone else has made. Other times it, it gets fixed into buildings or into structures, like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. No, that was not intentional. When they built that in, in uh, Italy, it tilted because of unstable ground. And now, since it's the Leaning Tower of Pisa, we've gone back in 1993 and in the early 2000s to make sure it doesn't lean too far, to, to strengthen it in its proper leaning form. Here in this series, as we've been gathering and taking an unvarnished look at our lives, without gloss, without texture, we are today going to be looking at mistakes. Mistakes. The errors that we make in our lives. There are times when we make a mistake that explodes our life. Maybe it blows up a marriage, maybe it ends a career, maybe it redirects our lives in a way that we just didn't intend before that mistake was made. And in today's story, it's the kind of mistake that feels like one of those ultimate mistakes where you're not only never gonna live it down, but you might not ever be able to live again because of what you've done. As we've looked at this unvarnished approach to discipleship, we've come to expect things. We've come to expect, like in that first week, that change is going to happen. We have to expect that we are a work in progress. We've also come to expect suffering. The suffering's pretty normal in this life. If we're going to serve a king, King Jesus, who willingly suffered, we're also going to have to suffer. And we've also come to expect that in our shadows of life, when the fog of this world settles in on us, we can and should expect God's grace to show up. Well, today, we're going to join in looking at the life of Peter in one more episode. And I would invite you to stand with me in a reading of God's Word. This is a little longer reading. I'm not going to read all that's listed in your program today. And I'll cue you whenever I jump. I'm in, currently in Mark chapter 14. I'm going to start in verse 26. Hear the word of the Lord. When they'd sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters. For it is written, I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I'll go before you to Galilee. Peter Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter vehemently denied this, saying, 
even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. Then they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I'm deeply grieved even to the point of death. Remain here and keep awake. Drop down to verse 43. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd, a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given a sign. The one that I kiss, this is the man, arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple courts teaching, and you didn't arrest me there. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen garment. And they caught hold of him, and he fled, leaving it behind. Down in verse 66 now. When Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I don't know or understand what you were talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But he denied it again. Then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them. You're a Galilean. But Peter began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know the man that you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for a second time. And then Peter remembered what Jesus had said to him. Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and he wept. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can find your seats. Now... Peter is a strong character. He is without question someone willing to stand with Jesus. I don't think anybody doubts that this hardworking, common man wants to be with Jesus. He was someone who was a great talker and also a doer. He did it both. He was willing to back up with action quickly responding, reacting, present, ready to do what needs to happen and what needed to be done. And it had to hurt in this earliest scene whenever Jesus looks at all of these closest followers and predicts that they will all become deserters. In verse 27, they had to say, what? Does three years with you not mean anything? Have you forgotten we've left our families and our jobs and our towns and the places that we know and we're coming to follow you? And then we get this interaction with, with Peter and, and Jesus. Peter steps forward like he always does and denies it. No, I'll be the last man standing. I'm going to be with you. And Jesus again pushes back against Peter and says, no, actually, tonight you're going to deny me. And Peter contradicts Jesus. Don't you love this? He has that kind of a relationship with Jesus where he can contradict and speak against. He hasn't learned from previous rebukes. God welcomes this kind of interchange. And so Peter is contradictory of Jesus and not only says, not only am I not going to deny you, but I vow, I promise that I'll die with you. And he's not alone. This is not just Peter. People fall in behind Peter and say, yeah, we're going to do the same. They're all on board. They're all in this. 
And so Jesus says, okay, come on, let's get started. Let's start with a vigil, a prayer vigil. You stay awake while I pray. And they cannot stay awake. And eventually one of the other 12, Judas, comes and betrays him. And in that moment, the disciples, including Peter, are ready. He was prepared for this fight. He came armed and he was, he was ready. Now, in Mark's gospel, Mark knows Peter the best. He traveled around with Peter in the ministry following Jesus' death. And yet, he doesn't identify Peter. We have to go to the gospel of John to find out that it's Peter that pulls out his sword and swings at the neck of the servant of the high priest. You see, this is, this is a religious group of people coming to arrest Jesus. Now, it wasn't just a dissection of trying to take Peter's ear off by the side. I mean, that seems a little strange. No, this is like the third guy that walks in the bar from last week. This third guy's ducking and loses his ear. First blood's been drawn, shots are fired. We're in the middle of this. However, Jesus stops it all. He surrenders. This is not the battle that he's going to fight. It's not the combat that he's going to enter. Staying in the fight for Jesus meant staying in it to surrender his life, to give it over. Now we can't question that Peter was ready to do what he needed to. And at this moment, whenever Peter is drawn blood, Jesus is surrendering, it's at that moment we get verse 50 where they all fled. And some of them, probably Mark, who wrote this gospel, fled without their clothes. They took off for their lives because surrendering was not the plan. Now this is a stark difference. It's stunning even in the reading, right? We get a little bit of whiplash. What happened in just the few hours to go from raising cups and being ready to, to die with Jesus, of making vows that we're going to not deny him, to this moment. Are they just a bunch of liars? No, they're not a bunch of liars. It's not that at all. It's just that the battle that they came to fight is not the one that Jesus wants them to fight. He waits. He waits in the midst of their confusion. And this night trial is a religious leader trial. Not the government, not the Romans, but all those leaders who want to know if Jesus will say that he is divine. Will he say that he's the king? And he does. He does, and that's all they need to get a blasphemy charge against Jesus. God's vision for the kingdom of God was not one of castles and crowns. It was not a kingdom to be built on this earth with swords and battles. It was a different kind of kingdom. Now, Peter can't stay away. Did you notice how his story is intertwined? Even though he took off and fled like everyone else, he's close by, and he's watching. And as the scene unfolds, he gets identified. A woman says, Peter. He doesn't call him by name, but she points out, you're a Galilean, you're a Nazareth person. You, you know this guy. He denies it? Uh-uh. A little while later, again, this is unique to Mark's, she points him out again and says to the bystanders, he's a Nazarene. He's the one. And then we get the third identification after Peter denies that from the bystanders themselves as they keep looking. And they say, yeah, you were with him. They identify him as one who was being with Jesus. And he calls down curses. And he raises his hand in a vow and says, I don't know this person at all. Now, here in this scene, this being identified with Jesus, that's what I want. That's what I want people to say about me in my life. That's what I want people to say about those of us at First Christian. That's a group of people who are with Jesus. And in this moment, Peter doesn't own up to it. He doesn't own up to that fact at all. And after we get through all the, the cock crowing and the denials that take place, Peter breaks down and weeps. That's the last words that I read to you. 
Strong men don't break down and weep publicly. Peter was one of these kind of strong men that wouldn't weep. But here in this moment of maybe his biggest mistake, his ultimate state, he weeps deeply. Now I know with us, when we think about turning our back on God, maybe that's a bit impersonal. But with Peter turning his back on the Son of God, on Jesus, he had walked with him. He knew him as a friend. This betrayal, this turning his back on Jesus was quite intimate and personal. Turning his back on three years of life together. Okay, now at this point, whenever you look at a text like this, Christians and preachers begin to belittle Peter. I mean, the basic sermon here is don't be like Peter. Don't deny. Don't be like all of the apostles who had such good intentions. And, and, and that's, a, that's a good, that's a, an appropriate message. We, I don't want to encourage people to deny Jesus. But if that's our message, if that's the simple message of don't be like Peter, we are missing the good news of this story. We're missing the gospel. Because Jesus goes into this knowing that they all are going to betray him. He knows it. He knows that even though they raised their cups, even though they raised their hands and made all these promises, all of them to the last person are going to be deniers. Denying, being a denier won't cut it. It will happen. They all flee. This mistake that they make is quite important. In fact, all of our mistakes are important. And I want to be very focused in here because it's easy to miss the scripture and think that this is about being perfect and not making mistakes. That we get these internal voices, if we're not supposed to be like Peter, then I'm such an idiot. Why did I make that mistake? I'm so stupid. Why do I keep doing that over and over again? Do you pile up these kind of things with us? The good news of this story is not about pointing out our mistakes and making us feel bad about ourselves. This is about directing our lives to follow the one who enters into these mistakes. To be able to give this self-talk of questioning why I always do what I do is not what this is about. In fact, those voices that are in our head, questioning us, pointing out our imperfection, that question is not the voice of God. That's the voice of the adversary. That's the voice of the roaring lion, pointing out your perfect imperfections and trying to make you feel like you do not measure up. One sin doesn't make or break your life. It doesn't lead you to death. Because that kind of thinking means that an alcoholic who takes one drink, well, I might as well take another, and one drink follows the next. Or one needle follows another needle, or one illicit thought or one angry thought follows another because, you know, if I've made one mistake, ah, might as well turn my back on it all now. No, this is about being alerted to the spiritual life of being drawn into what is the good news of this story. That God's love for us is undeniable. That Jesus goes into this scene knowing that we're going to let him down. That God is willing to be present in the midst of suffering and rejection and death. That he will face it. And we're not too far gone. We're not outside the love of God. And we cannot be, believe the lies that are in our head that one mistake is going to break the bank, destroy our marriage, or blow up our life forever. It is not. We have to break out of the stuckness of that moment and look deeper. You know, one of the things that I get asked a lot whenever people read through the gospel, and it's happened a couple of times in this series, and that's why is Jesus so prone to silence? Have you noticed this as we've looked throughout the Gospels? That Jesus will have someone identify who he is as the Son of God and he'll say, shh, yeah, just don't tell anything. Don't tell anyone. He's so mute about who he is. Well, here in this story is the first place where Jesus 
in this trial says, yes, yes, I'm the Holy One of God. Yes, I'm the Messiah. He even uses the word I am, the divine word of God that was given to Moses. Now, he says it in Greek, at least as it's recorded in Mark, but it is enough for them to say, oh, we know exactly who you are. It's in this scene that the script gets flipped and Jesus speaks up for who he is and Peter gets silent. All those other times when we're quick to identify who Jesus is, now we sit in silence when push comes to shove. Here in this moment, Jesus comes inside of our mistakes and identifies who he is and stands up for us on our behalf. Wow. I mean, that boggles my mind that this is the moment when Jesus chooses to speak up for us. What we're seeing is what love looks like, undeniable love that we cannot escape, a love that wraps us up and holds us. Christianity is not about just, oh, try harder. It's different. Where standing up means standing by and letting Jesus be surrendered. Where speaking up means showing love not just for you and for your views, but showing love for others. God's love for us is that deep. Now, when we come into this, it's easy to, in our lives, wonder where God is in the midst of our suffering. Have you been there? Whenever you face something that's not fair, that's unjust, whenever you face a death or a loss or a diagnosis or something that's just so aggravating, where is God? Well, that's the good news of this story, of where Jesus shows up in the midst of suffering to show an undeniable love. Where God is is right in the middle of the mess. He's right there with us, speaking up where we're silent, standing up when we're ready to run away and flee. Jesus is right there to love us through our suffering. When it comes to mistakes, there's a lot that we can learn from mistakes. We don't have to be afraid of them or troubled by them, but mistakes can be a good thing. So I want to give you a couple of things uh, maybe to think about. There's a guy by the name, a professor by the name of Robert Wilson, who's at the, the University of Arizona. And he, he studies a, a hormone that gets released in our brain whenever we make a mistake. He conducted a an experiment a number of years back of even working with computers of how computers respond to mistakes and has found that whenever we make a mistake 15% of the time, it's actually more effective for our learning. Whenever it it's doesn't come easy and we don't reach that perfect 100, whenever we have to struggle a little bit, that 15% makes us a better learner. Computers learn better and we learn better in that little in-between. Now, students don't hear me say, shoot for that B average. That, that, that's, not, that's not what we're going for here. It's something almost for, for us to wrap our minds around how we actually learn, maybe even something for teachers, that those mistakes become the place where we most can learn, most can grow. Another example, a different kind of 85% rule. Probably right now, one of the most famous runners who's recently retired in the last handful of years is Usain Bolt. He is the one with name recognition because he won so many events. You know Usain? Cocky, confident guy. Runs the 100 meter and does it in under 10 seconds. Usain Bolt's approach to running the 100 meters is a little unusual. Those first 30 meters, he is coming up out of his stance and leaning forward and keeping his head down as he slowly is coming up. He is using everything he can to get started in those first 30 meters. After that, when he's fully erect and running, he begins to relax. He begins to relax the muscles in his face to unclench his hands, release his shoulders, to take back that 100% effort just a little bit to take in what's going on. Because when we're straining and trying for perfection, just with everything that's within us, 
we lose our mental capacity. And he had learned that if you back off just a little bit, you can adjust. You can see where you are, increase your speed, think about what's going on. Now, I like that. I like that approach of not viewing our lives so much of trying to strain everything out, but step back and relax and let all that training and the diet and the preparation come to you in the moment of that race and to trust the winds that are blowing you towards the finish line. This group of disciples made a vow that they would die with Jesus. And it's a vow that they actually got to keep. Did you realize that? Now, they didn't die with Jesus that night. Did Jesus need them to die with him? I don't think so. He knew what was going to happen. He knew their level of training at that point. He knew that he was the one that was going to die. They would die and be executed, most of them, at varying points of their life. So they got to fulfill that vow of dying with and for Jesus. The point of Jesus' suffering and the point of his cross is not simply gore. It's not just simply that God needs some kind of suffering. The point of the cross, the point of that suffering, is to show the undeniable love of God, of how he's willing to join us in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our questions, a love that won't let us go even when we're running away. A love that holds on to us relentlessly in spite of our mistakes. Because of our mistakes, God is present in the middle of that. And I think that allows us to be a little more honest. When we make a mistake, we can admit it. We can be forthright about it. Because that mistake doesn't define who we are. It's not determinative. We are someone who's loved by God. We are chosen by God and invited to live with God. In fact, that's the way of life that we've chosen. That's our run. That's our path. Choosing the way of love. And all these mistakes, all this suffering that we must endure, the injustice in our life and the world, these become experience for us. Can't you say that about your own life? The mistakes that you've made, the things that you've suffered, become places where God most can teach us about what it is to keep pressing forward. Let's pray. God, your love is undeniable. It's unmistakable. And we thank you for the forgiveness that you offer us. We, we ask that you help us to live into your invitation of embracing this undeniable love, of being wrapped up in it, being able to show that same love to other people. God, thank you for not defining us based upon our mistakes, on our weaknesses, on the places where we have not succeeded. And we ask that you'll give us the determination we, knew, we need to know that you are God and we are not, so that we can be as you have made us, children of God, beloved by God, to live with you forever. This is our prayer through Jesus. Amen.